Chancellor, Engineer Professor Osase Faraday Orumese, Fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers, here heavily represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Administration, Professor Jacob Ayerobo, other principal officers of the university, Provost Deans and Directors, America Professors, CMD UPTH, Visiting Vice Chancellors from Sisters Institutions, Top Government Functionaries, our Lord Spiritual and Temporal, Staff and Students, Invited Guests, Gentlemen of the Press, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome every one of you to today's inaugural lecture. This is the 191st in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin to be delivered by Professor Mrs. Adesua Itoa Osaon. Topic, that no Nigerian becomes blind needlessly, the burden of avoidable blindness in Nigeria. May I humbly invite the registrar, or should the Mrs. to introduce the Vice Chancellor, and members of the Vice Chancellor's procession, the Registrar. Distinguished invitees, you are all welcome to the 194th inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Please permit me to stand on the existing protocol already observed by the University PRO as I introduce the Vice Chancellor's entourage. It is my rare privilege and honor to introduce the Vice Chancellor's entourage, which is led by the Vice Chancellor, Professor F. F. O. Orumesi, who is ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor Jacob Ahirobo. Others in the Vice Chancellor's entourage are the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor P. E. Iruwogwe. We also have the Deputy Vice Chancellor Ekema Campus, Professor G. E. Erei Aremo. We have the University Liberian who is represented by Mr. Lee Obasi. We have representing the BOSA, Dr. B. A. Akoguma. We have on the other side of the days, Provost Deans and Directors. We have representing the Provost College of Medical Sciences, Professor E. P. Garoro. We have the Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, Professor Victor E. Omozua. We have the Dean of Students, Professor O. B. Osadolo. We have the Host Dean, School of Medicine, Professor N. I. Momo. We have the Dean, Faculty of Agriculture, Professor N. A. Bamikone. We have representing the Dean, Faculty of Arts, Professor B. A. Okolo. We have the Dean, School of Basic Medical Sciences, Professor Mrs. H. A. Obu. We have the Dean, School of Dentistry, Professor O. N. Ogodwe. We have the Dean, Faculty of Education, Professor E.O.S. Iyamu. We have representing the Dean, Faculty of Law, Professor Mrs. V.E. Onoha. We have the Dean, Faculty of Life Sciences, Professor Mrs. O.I. Nabunene. We have the Dean, Faculty of Pharmacy, Professor J. O. Akerele. Dean, Faculty of Physical Sciences, Professor S. E. Omosiko. We also have directors, 
We have Director, Center for Gender Studies, Professor Mrs. E. U. Edo Soma. We also have Director, Center for Educational Technology, Professor A. U. Osunje. We have the Director, Gender Studies, Professor J. A. Akwavi. We have Director Center for Part-Time Programs, Professor Mrs. K.A. Irakona. We have Director of Distance Learning Programs, Professor F.E. Omorui. We also have Director IPAES, Professor S.O. Ibeli. We have Acting Director Institute of Education, Dr. D. Omorogbe. We have Acting Director, Center for Maritime and ICT, Dr. Mrs. P. E. Orugbe. It is now my pleasure to call on the Vice Chancellor to introduce the lecturer of the day. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Addressed by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Faraday, Friday of Sassari of FNSC, who would have loved to be here before uh, today, but have been taken away by call of duty. I'm reading his speech. Let me stand on the already established protocol. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to the 191st inaugural lecture of the University of Benin. Today's lecture is the 44th to be delivered in my tenure as the Vice Chancellor of this University. The 41st lecture to be delivered in the College of Medical Science and the 32nd in the School of Medicine, University of Benin. As part of my routine updates on activities in the University of Benin, I want to use this medium to inform you that the 2016-2017 second semester lectures are going on smoothly in the schools, faculties, and institutes. I thank you all for your cooperation and support in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our lecturer for today. She is Professor Mrs. Adesua Itoha Osawa. The title of her lecture is That No Nigerian Becomes Blind Needlessly, The Burden of Avoidable Blindness in Nigeria. Professor Adesua Itoha Osawa was born on the 31st of August 1954 in Benin City to the family of Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Ibirawene Egwaboy of blessed memory. She had her primary school education at St. Matthew's Anglican School and Government School, Benin City, 1916 to 1965. She started her secondary school education at Baptist Girls High School, Angor, in 1966, but this was truncated in 1967 by the Nigerian Civil War. She then returned to Benin City, where she completed the secondary school education at the Baptist High School, Benin City, in 1970. She was admitted into the University of Benin, the then Midwest Institute of Technology, in 1971, and was awarded the Benin Area Joint Board Scholarship for her full university education. She graduated in 1978 with Bachelor of Mercy and Bachelor of Surgery with distinction in both pharmacology and mental health, winning two prestigious awards in the school. She did her internship between 1978 and 1979 and National Youth Service from 1979 to 1980, both activities at UBTH in Benin City. She commenced her residency training in 1981 in the Department of Ophthalmology, UBTH, relocated to the United Kingdom early in 1982 to join her husband and continued her training as a registrar 
in ophthalmology at the Sutherland IV Family Sunderland and Newcastle uh, General Hospital in Newcastle from time. She obtained diploma in ophthalmology DU in 1984 and continued with the Nigerian residency program upon her return to Nigeria in 1986. She joined the services of the University of Benin as lecturer one in November 1988 and rose through the rank by date of hard work and was promoted to the position of professor in October 2007, making her the first female professor of ophthalmology in the University of Minnesota. Her area of specialization is public health ophthalmology, with special interest in the treatment of glaucoma. Professor Osaho is currently the head department of ophthalmology, University of Minnesota. She has held academic um, she has held academic and administrative positions within and outside the university, such as Chairman UBTA Shopping Center Committee, 1995 to 1996, Hall Worthy Clinical Students Hostel, University of Benin, 1997 to 1998, Coordinator Department Outreach Program, 1998 to date, President Medical Women's Association of Nigeria. 1995 to 1997, Acting Head Department of Ophthalmology, 1996 to 2000, Vice President, the Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria, 2005 to 2002 to 2005, School of Medicine Representative in College Appointment and Promotion Board, 2013 to 2014, Chairman UDSS Management Board, 2013 to date. Professor Osahong has supervised many undergraduate and postgraduate students and has served as a standard examiner and assessor to several universities and postgraduate bodies in different institutions within and outside the country for over two decades. To her credit, she has supervised over a dozen dissertations for the Part Two Fellowship Examination and she has trained about 60 postgraduate doctors in ophthalmology, some of whom are professors, heads of department, chief medical directors of teaching from specialist hospitals, and so on. She has also attended several conferences, seminars, and workshops within and outside Nigeria to present papers or attend training programs, and has contributed to the advancement of knowledge with over 40 publications in reputable local and international journals, book chapters, and conference proceedings. She is a reviewer of articles for publications in peer reviewed journals such as Nigeria Postgraduate Medical Journal 2002 to 2008, Nigerian Journal of Ophthalmology 2001 to 2005, Saudi Medical Journal 2006 to 2009. Nigeria Medical Journal 2003 to 2009, Nigeria Journal of Clinical Practice 2004 to 8, Annals of Our Medical Sciences 2006 to 8. <laughs> Professor Osamu obtained the fellowship of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria (NCMC) Ophthalmology in May 1988, the West African College of Surgeons in 1994 and the International College of Surgeons in 1998. She is also a member and fellow of several associations and professional bodies, such as the Nigerian Medical Association, Medical Women Association of Nigeria, American Academy of Ophthalmology, British Medical Association, General Medical Council of England, Canadian Implant Surgery Association, Royal College of Ophthalmology London, Oxford Ophthalmological Congress, England, and she is a recipient of a one special recognition, such as Professor Kenneth Hughes Price for the best student in pharmacology in 1996, in 1976, and Professor Lambos Price for the best student in mental health in 1978. <laughs> Professor Osama is an ordained deaconess of the Covenant Life Baptist Church, Mugawa Benisi. She is a very keen golfer and loves Christian music. 
She is happily married to Dr. Ruben O. Osahan, former medical director of Psychiatric Hospital in Selu, Venezuela. They are blessed with three children. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to invite Professor Mrs. Adesua Itoha Osahan, a professor of ophthalmology, to deliver Now I want to take the preamble. I would like to start by thanking the Almighty God for making it possible for me to be here to deliver the 191st inaugural lecture of the University of Benin. This is the third inaugural lecture from the Department of Ophthalmology. I'm indeed very grateful to you, Mr. Vice Chancellor, for your kind approval of my application to deliver my lecture. It is a great privilege and honor for me to stand before such a distinguished audience to deliver this lecture. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all. The topic of my dissertation for the Part 2 Fellowship of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria was Nutritional Eye Diseases in Childhood, Osaho 1988. The findings from that study actually inspired me to sub-specialize in public health ophthalmology. In the study, 46 children were examined. Five of them became blind. Mortality was also high with six deaths. Blindness from nutritional eye disease is completely preventable. And severe vitamin A deficiency is closely linked with high mortality. Sanford Smith, 1997. Most of the parents in the study were ignorant, poor, and illiterate. The dissertation highlighted the complex relationship between protein, energy, malnutrition, vitamin A deficiency, measles, and eye disease. The national campaign in support of exclusive breastfeeding, the fortification of various foods with vitamin A, and efforts by pediatricians and nutritionists have all helped to reduce the scourge of blindness from these preventable conditions. There has also been a massive reduction in measles infection as a result of the expanded program of immunization of UNICEF and WHO. I have chosen the topic that no Nigerian becomes blind needlessly, the burden of avoidable blindness in Nigeria. Because of numerous cases of needless blindness that I have seen in the course of my job and research of over 30 years as an ophthalmologist. This is the outline for the lecture as listed. Now we go over to the introduction. The eyes. The eyes are the most treasured sense organs. We should take good care of our eyes. They are precious, they are delicate. The eye is the light of the body. Blindness therefore implies living in perpetual darkness. In Matthew 6, 22, Jesus asserts that the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
The importance of good vision cannot therefore be overemphasized. The eye is a window to the rest of the body, as we can recognize a number of systemic diseases by examining the fundus, which is the inside of the eye. That is the retina, the blood vessels, and the optic disc. Some conditions that might require a lot of elaborate tests to diagnose can be picked up by a thorough examination of the fundus. The eye medical doctor, as the ophthalmologist, is sometimes the first port of call for patients with diabetes, hypertension, sickle cell disease, and high cholesterol due to eye complications. Sometimes during fundoscopy, which is an examination of the inside of the eyeball, we have seen cholesterol plaques in the blood vessels of our patients when they present with sudden painless loss of vision in one eye. This is the result of blockage of the main artery or vein of the eye, known as central retina artery or central retina vein occlusion. Several diseases in the body have eye complications which can lead to blindness. It is my hope that this lecture will enlighten this distinguished audience on the various causes of blindness and provide evidence that about 80% of blindness is preventable or avoidable. From the womb, the cradle to old age, it is very possible to prevent blindness. Most of us here are familiar with the story of blind Bartimaeus in the Bible in Mark 10, 46 to 52. Blind Bartimaeus was desperate to have his sight restored, and the more people shouted him down and told him to be quiet, the more he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus miraculously restored the sight of blind Bartimaeus. This story, among others, emphasizes how desperate a blind person can be in order to have his or her sight restored. Human resources for eye care. Provision of ophthalmic care to the populace is based on teamwork. And the members of the team include the ophthalmologist, who is a medically qualified eye doctor, who possesses a postgraduate qualification in ophthalmology, after a residency training program of six years. He is the leader of the eye care team. The job of the ophthalmologist is to render total eye care, medical, surgical, eye operations, and optical prescribing of glasses. The optometrist is a non-medically qualified university graduate whose job it is to test the patient's refractive state and prescribe appropriate optical correction for them. He also provides treatments for low vision and help with low vision rehabilitation. He has the Doctor of Optometry OD degree and can diagnose and refer patients with eye diseases. The dispensing optician is responsible for cutting the lenses and fixing glasses and is usually a non-university graduate. The ophthalmic nurse is specially trained after general nursing to provide ophthalmic nursing care. Their duties include vision testing, basic eye procedures like removal of superficial foreign bodies from the eye, installation of eye drops and assisting in clinics. And they are also, they're also involved in counseling of patients. The primary eye care worker is in the community. It's at the grassroots and they are trained in vision testing, recognition of minor eye problems, and they, can, they also cancel patients. The need for cooperation among members of this team cannot be overemphasized in order to provide an efficient ophthalmological service to the populace. Now we'll go over to brief anatomy of the eye and its functions. The eye is developmentally a part of the brain, so the eye is as delicate as the brain. And the optic nerve, which is the second cranial nerve, connects the eyeball to the brain, as shown in the diagram. That's the optic nerve, as it's a cross-section of the eyeball. 
that is the entire brain, and that's the little eyeball there connected to the brain via the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a bundle of over one million nerve fibers, and it's responsible for transmitting nerve signals from the eye to the brain. Other parts of the eye. The lens is the elastic, transparent, biconvex structure located behind the pupil. It can become opaque as one ages, and the condition is known as cataract. The retina acts like the film in the camera, and when focused light strikes the retina, signals are transmitted via the optic nerve to the brain. The extraocular muscles, there are six of them. There are six extraocular muscles attached to the eyeball, and they are responsible for the various eye movements. Now we go on to overview of blindness. Definition of blindness. The 10th edition of the World Health Organization International Classification of Diseases, ICD-10, defines blindness as best corrected visual acuity worse than 3 over 60 in the better eye, or a visual field less than 10 degrees from fixation, WHO 1992. The occurrence of blindness in an individual can have a devastating impact on his social economic life. It affects the performance of activities of daily living, making him almost totally dependent on others. The economic losses arising from blindness, both at the individual and community levels, are therefore enormous. Hence, any effort expended in preventing the problem of blindness is always highly rewarding, both to the individual and the community. Ebony Paribo says, this means when the eye is damaged or blind, beauty is gone. This may be true, but there is rehabilitation of the blind. And a blind person can still live a happy and fulfilled life. Blindness is a surmountable handicap, so we should not be discouraged when blindness strikes. There are several examples of successful blind men and women um, and uh, because there's ability in disability. See, the Wanda of the US and Olubumi Dada in Nigeria are typical examples of very successful blind musicians. Blindness and the associated impacts have for many years been recognized as a public health problem globally. The current, the most current statistics on global blindness were those of 2010. According to WHO estimates, about 285 million people were visually impaired globally in 2010, out of which 39 million were blind, as in 2010. It was estimated that in the absence of effective interventions, the number of blind people in the world will reach 76 million by the year 2020. 90% of the world's visually impaired live in the developing and low-income nations of the world, of which Nigeria is one. Globally, the commonest causes of blindness according to 2010 statistics were cataracts, 51%, glaucoma, 8%, age-related macular degeneration, 5%. This pie chart gives us the statistics for global blindness. So we can take a look at it. We can see that cataracts takes the bulk of it, more than 50%. So cataracts is the commonest cause of blindness globally. Blindness in Nigeria. We've we'll finished with the global aspect. Blindness in Nigeria. The Nigerian National Blindness and Visual Impairment Survey, conducted from 2005 to 2007, was the first and only truly national survey of blindness and visual impairment in Nigeria so far. The overall prevalence of blindness was 0.78% from the survey. And the absolute number blind in Nigeria was about 1.1 million, with over 3 million having visual impairments. About 84% of causes of blindness was avoidable. That means preventable and treatable. And the major avoidable causes included cataracts, glaucoma, aphakia, corneal opacity, trachoma, refractive errors, onchocerciasis, and diabetic retinopathy. The prevalence of blindness due to glaucoma is higher in Nigeria at 16.7% compared with 8% globally. 
This emphasizes the fact that the burden of blindness from glaucoma in Nigeria is high, which makes glaucoma a major public health problem. The high prevalence of blindness and visual impairment in Nigeria is attributed to a number of factors, including inadequate, ineffective, and mal distribution of human resources. Rabio et al. 2012. Mass regional variation was also found in this survey, and the highest prevalence of blindness of 6.1% was found in the northeast geopolitical zone, while the lowest, 2.8%, was found in the southwest geopolitical zone. That's a map of Nigeria showing the number of blind adults in the different geopolitical zones in Nigeria. What are the risk factors for blindness? The risk factors for blindness include older age, females, rural residents, and illiteracy were among the risk factors for blindness reported. Avoidable blindness. Avoidable blindness as defined by the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness is blindness which could be either treated or prevented by known cost-effective means. Four out of five, 80% of the world's blind are avoidably so. In view of the magnitude of avoidable blindness globally, the WHO and more than 25 international NGOs involved in eye care and prevention of blindness launched the Vision 2020 The Right to Sight program, which is a global initiative for the elimination of avoidable blindness by the year 2020. The international community intends to fight avoidable blindness through disease control and, pre and prevention, training of personnel, strengthening of the existing eye care infrastructure, use of appropriate and affordable technology, and resource mobilization. Vision 2020 has yielded positive results since it was launched in 1999, as evidenced by a reduction in the incidence of trachoma, onchocerciasis, and the eye complications of vitamin A deficiency, but in 2009, Fizi et al. 2010. The Global Action Plan was also launched in 2013. This was to consolidate the achievements of Vision 2020. This new Global Action Plan has, as its vision, a world where nobody is needlessly blind, where those with unavoidable visual loss can achieve their maximum potential, and where there is universal access to comprehensive eye health services. The aim is to reduce avoidable blindness by 25% by the year 2019. Currently, there are just 560 ophthalmologists in Nigeria. And the current population of Nigeria is about 182 million from the National Population Commission website 2017. This therefore translates to a ratio of three ophthalmologists to one million population. This poor ratio is compounded by the fact that most of these ophthalmologists or the eye doctors, about 80%, live in urban areas, living in rural areas underserved. In Nigeria, about 70% of the population live in rural areas. What are the leading causes of avoidable blindness in Nigeria? In this lecture, my emphasis shall be on the two leading causes of avoidable blindness in Nigeria. They are cataracts and glaucoma. Cataracts, popularly known as Upo in the Benin language. It is defined as opacification of the crystalline lens. It accounts for 43% of blindness in Nigeria. But the good news about cataracts is that blindness from cataracts is reversible and curable. Most cases of cataracts are age-related. As people live longer, the number of persons with cataracts will increase. The risk factors for cataracts, what are the risk factors? Increasing age is a risk factor for cataracts. Genetic predisposition can run in families. Female sex, uh, smoking, diabetes, steroid use, diet low in antioxidants, 
ultraviolet light exposure like we have in the tropics, too much sun rays, biomass fields, body mass index, those who have lean body mass index, and episodes of severe dehydration, Abdul Letal 2014. Other risk factors are trauma, ocular infections. That's a photograph of a man with bilateral mature cataracts. He's blind in both eyes from bilateral mature cataracts. What was the treatment of cataracts? The only known treatment for cataracts is surgical removal. With advances in technology, cataract surgery can now be performed in about half an hour or less with the insertion of an intraocular lens, which restores the eye to almost near normal vision. It is possible to do it as a day case. The patient doesn't need hospitalization. And it's also possible to do it uh, to, for the procedure to be sutureless, resulting in very rapid uh, visual rehabilitation. This was not the case about three decades ago, uh, prior to the advent of microsurgery with intraocular lens implants. In the last decade, a more modern form of cataract surgery known as phaco emulsification has also become available in Nigeria. The surgery is very quick. It requires a very small incision and an ultrasonic device is used to break up the cataract and the fragments are then aspirated out of the eye. This is then followed by the insertion of an intraocular lens. The cataract backlog, that's number of unoperated cases of cataract in Nigeria, is very high, as most people who need cataract surgical services cannot access them. Cataract surgical rates is the number of cataract surgeries performed per million population per year. In 2006, the cataract surgical rate in Nigeria was only 300, compared as against the target of 2,000 for Africa. So we are not anywhere near. We do 300 cataract cases per million population per year, according to statistics. This situation is likely to worsen as the population ages. It is therefore not surprising that our senior colleagues in ophthalmology previously advised a reorientation to community ophthalmology. IRO 1983 and Akinshete 1997. One of my studies on cataract surgery output, which was carried out over a decade ago, revealed the meager contribution of teaching hospitals to the prevention of blindness from cataracts. The study revealed that only 106 cataract surgeries were performed in the 24 months reviewed. Several factors, including ignorance, Poverty, socioeconomic factors, political tensions, and teaching hospital bureaucracy were identified to be responsible. Osahon 2002. Currently, it costs about 60,000 naira to have cataract surgery performed in UBTH. This fee is similar to what is um, charged in other teaching hospitals. And this fee excludes additional miscellaneous expenses. And the national minimum wage, as we are all aware, is still 18,000 naira. It is obvious that for most low income and even middle class families, cataract surgery is unaffordable. It is therefore not surprising that when free cataract surgery outreaches are announced in the media, hundreds of people present for surgery. In our study, on eye care outreach program to rural communities in Edo and Delta states of Nigeria, carried out during a one week period in September 2001. 104 patients were operated upon for various eye diseases. The commonest was cataracts. We operated on 78 patients for cataracts. It was at all 2004. This surgical output we achieved in one week was what most teaching hospitals in the country were able to achieve in six months because it was free. That's why the patient turned up to have their cataracts removed. Due to high cost of surgery nationwide, some patients, especially in the rural areas and also in the cities, they resort to traditional methods of treatment referred to as couching. During couching, a needle, a very long needle, is used 
to dislocate the lens into the vitreous, into the back of the eye, with all its attendant complications, including total blindness. This procedure is done without any form of anesthesia, and the conditions are not aseptic. Many of these cultures have no fixed address, and the patients are not followed up after surgery. Herbal extracts are also applied to the eyes of some patients for several months before seeking medical attention. Inflammation from the toxic effect of traditional treatment worsens the visual outcome after cataract surgery. Patients often do this because they, they believe some forms of herbs or eye drops can melt away the cataract, but this is not so. Cataract has to be surgically removed. What you can see on the screen is just to demonstrate couching. That's a very long needle with which couching is performed. This long needle is placed at the corner of the eye and the lens, the cataract, is pushed back into the inside of the eyeball with all the uh, consequences that you can expect, including total blindness. Some patients believe that their cataract blindness is even spiritual due to witchcraft. And they consult traditional healers and religious leaders for solution. And in the process, some of them are advised to bring uh, items like goats, rams, chicken, and money to appease the gods and ward off all the evil spirits. Now we go on to glaucoma, which is the second commonest cause of avoidable blindness. Glaucoma is defined as an optic neuropathy in which raised intraocular pressure is a significant risk factor usually associated with characteristic visual field defects. Glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. It is different from cataract because cataract is the commonest cause of reversible blindness. Blindness from cataract can easily be reversed, but not blindness from glaucoma. Globally, there were 60.5 million people with glaucoma in 2010. And this will increase to 79.6 million by 2020, out of which 11.2 million will be bilaterally blind. This number will increase, will increase further if concerted efforts are not made to screen and identify people in the early stages with a view to preventing blindness. A population-based survey of the prevalence and types of glaucoma in Nigeria revealed that the prevalence of glaucoma of all types was 5.02 percent KRA 2015. One in every 20 Nigerians aged 40 years and above had glaucoma and one in five persons with glaucoma was blind. Glaucoma is often referred to as a silent thief of sight. Why is it a silent thief of sight? It is because of lack of warning symptoms on the delayed stages of the disease. That makes it similar to hypertension, which is a silent, mysterious killer. So glaucoma is very similar to hypertension, the silent, mysterious killer. Blindness from glaucoma can be prevented by early detection and prompt treatment. What you can see on the screen is a normal optic disc. That's the nerve of the eye. That is normal, it's pink, and the blood vessels are looking quite healthy. This is a cross-section of the normal eye, and this is a cross-section of the eye with glaucoma. That nerve, the optic nerve, bears the brunt of damage due to glaucoma. So the nerve can really uh, get all the, um, the damage as a result of glaucoma. There are different types of glaucoma, but in Nigeria, the commonest adult type is primary open angle glaucoma. The acute close angle is more common amongst Caucasians, the whites. In sub-Saharan Africa, glaucoma presents at a much younger age, at a later stage, and progresses more rapidly. So there is increasing lifetime risk of blindness. So this is just to say that glaucoma occurs in Africans, in Nigerians, at an earlier age, is more aggressive, and is also more difficult to treat. By the way, the definition of blindness, Many people um, who move around unaided with visual field of less than 10 degrees from fixation, they are actually blind. And such people have tunnel vision. 
Note that by the WHO definition, blindness is assessed by both learning uh, reading charts and visual fields. That's the ability to see all around you. I would like us to cock our hands. Place your hands in front of your eyes and look through the face. So come. When you are looking at the face, so come. As you are looking through the space, so come. You are not supposed to see from the sides. That's what we mean by tunnel vision. And by WHO definition of blindness, any person with tunnel vision, vi visual field of less than 10 degrees from fixation is actually blind. That's a blind man. You are able to see in the straight ahead position. You are still moving around, but you are bumping into objects on the sides. You are bumping into things. That is tunnel vision. And that occurs when there is end stage of very advanced glaucoma. Uh, that's just a synonymous chart for checking visual acuity. The top line there says 6 over 60, that's poor vision. And the bottom line there says 6 over 6, that's normal eyesight. In Nigeria, we refer to it as 6 over 6. But in America, it's referred to as 2020. 2020 because it's measured in feet. In Nigeria, we measure it in meters. So, so what we said about tunnel vision is that you might even have vision acuity of 6 over 6, as is normal. But you have tunnel vision because your visual fields are gone because of damage from glaucoma. And therefore, you are registered blind by the WHO standard. Patients with NSA glaucoma have normal visual acuity, but they have tunnel vision. Such patients are really not allowed to drive in developed countries where they are registered blind. We do not have any blind register in Nigeria. So people escape being disallowed to drive. They escape and they, everybody is a driver. It is therefore possible that some cases of accidents on our roads might be caused by drivers with end stage glaucoma and tunnel vision. Such individuals who still drive motor vehicles are putting their lives and those of other road users at risk. What you can see on the screen is advanced locomotors copy. If you can recall, the other optic disc I showed you was nice and pink. This is now pale. It is copped. And the other optic disc there is also a locomotors one with hemorrhage at the edge of the disc. That's hemorrhage. And it's a sign of progressive glaucoma. What are the risk factors for glaucoma? The risk factors include increasing age again, Adults 40 years and above, people of African descent are at higher risk than whites. This is not because of the color of their skin, but due to a genetic basis. Elevated eye pressure, family history, eye injury, hypertension, and low blood pressure, current cigarette smoking, myopia, diabetes, use of steroids. Wilson 1987, Kiari et al. 2016. Many of our glaucoma patients present in the advanced stages of the disease, and the absence of early warning symptoms is a major contributing factor. What are the treatment options available for glaucoma? There are currently three modalities medical treatment, and this medical treatment is actually the first line and is the most acceptable form of treatment. And it's often done using eye drops and sometimes combined with tablets. Glaucoma is a chronic disease that requires lifelong treatment. This treatment is usually not acceptable to most patients as they often prefer a one-time magic cure as with some other diseases. There are, however, some problems with medical treatment. The drugs are expensive, they could be fake, substandard and the compliance may be poor and they may lose efficacy due to storage, poor storage conditions. A lot of the glaucoma drugs have to be stored in cool uh, places. Surgical treatment. This has been recommended as the best for Africans and is the best option for the poor who cannot afford the cost of medical treatment for a lifetime. There is however poor acceptance of surgery as we would expect for fear of going completely blind. So when you offer surgery, patients decline. They don't want to go blind. So they don't accept surgery so easily. 
Glaucoma surgery does not also result in a dramatic improvement in vision, the way cataract surgery does. It only stabilizes the vision and ensures no further damage occurs. It ensures the patient doesn't go blind. Laser treatment is a non-invasive option for the management of glaucoma. Patients may require repeat sessions of laser combined with medical treatment. However, most eye clinics in Africa, they lack the equipment and the necessary infrastructure to support the youth. What is my contribution to ophthalmology? Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I would like to talk about my humble contribution to my great specialty. When I finished my residency training in May 1988, I was convinced that public health or community ophthalmology was the way to go in order to make a significant impact in reducing the burden of avoidable blindness in Nigeria. I had to attend several workshops and courses in preventive ophthalmology, including courses in tropical ophthalmology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. My contribution to ophthalmology can most conveniently be summarized under the following three headings. Training, research, and service to humanity. Now we go on to training. To the glory of God, I have been involved in manpower development in ophthalmology with the training of over 60 ophthalmologists since my appointment as lecturer one in 1988. Among this number are professors of ophthalmology and others who have served or are serving as medical directors, chairman medical advisory committee, and heads of departments in their various institutions. More specifically, I have supervised over 12 dissertations of senior residents for the award of the fellowship of both postgraduate colleges. I have also been an examiner at both pass one and two level for both postgraduate colleges since the last two decades. I have also lectured many sets of ophthalmic nurses of the post basic School of Nursing in UBTH because they are a formidable part of the eye care team. I have had the privilege of teaching medical students for over three decades. A good number of them have achieved enviable heights in the profession, both within and outside the country. Great universe! Great universe students! Research publications now. I have over 40 peer-reviewed publications in local and international journals. For the purpose of this lecture, I will highlight some of them which are significant to public health ophthalmology. The first one is congenital syphilis, a cause of preventable blindness. We reported a case of congenital syphilis in a 25-day-old baby who was blind in both eyes. The mother had an episode of fever at 34 weeks of gestation and she was treated, otherwise pregnancy was uneventful. The baby was born with multiple abnormalities at birth. Both parents and baby had positive VDRL tests. We concluded in this study that this baby was needlessly blind as a result of maternal infection with syphilis which could have been detected and treated, thereby preventing transplacental transmission to the baby. Osahon and Ibani Sebo, 1995. <laughs> Removal of the eyeball. Although the primary duty of the eye doctor, the ophthalmologist, is sight preservation and restoration, sometimes it becomes necessary to remove the eyeball in order to preserve the life of the patient from an overwhelming infection and life-threatening tumors of the eye. The first method of eyeball removal is enucleation of the eye. A study was carried out on enucleation of the eye over a 15-year period. Tumors, 58.5%, and staphyloma, 70%, were the commonest indications for enucleation, which is removal of the eyeball. The commonest tumor encountered in this study 
was retinoblastoma and the patients presented quite late. We concluded that public enlightenment in the national media should be carried out as a way of improving awareness regarding the causes and prevention of eye diseases that will eventually lead to removal of the eyeball, Osaho and Otobu, 1995. Uh, this uh, photograph is not very clear, but that's a photograph of a two-year-old child with advanced retinoblastoma. This child had to have that eyeball removed, and the study was carried out by Osamo and uh, Enoch in 1996. Evistration of the eye is another method of eyeball removal. Uh, with this method, there is preservation of the eye muscles and the scleral coat as well as the optic nerve. This is to enable the artificial eye we are going to fit in the socket to move as the eye moves. So it's more acceptable cosmetically, the method of evisceration, more acceptable cosmetically. And in this study, the causes of evisceration were panoptamitis, which means overwhelming eye infection to the extent that the eyeball, this beautiful eyeball, becomes converted to a bag of pus. So 57.96% of the patients had evisceration of the eye. They, were, they had panoptamitis. Trauma, 20.46. Anterior sapidoma, 7.96. And painful blind eye, 6.68. Bovtamic blind eye, 1.13. And unknown causes, 6.81. We concluded that early presentation to hospital after any eye injury Avoidance of ocular self medication, as well as, as, that, as, well as um, that there are ways of reducing the prevalence of pan ophthalmitis, because pan ophthalmitis is very preventable. We also recommended strict enforcement of the use of seat belts while driving, because many of the trauma cases were ROTAs, where windscreen shattered into the eyeballs, the globes of the patients. And we also um, recommended general improvement in security because in lots of the uh, cases of injury were due to gunshot wounds. So we, advo we, 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 uh, we advocated general improvement in security to prevent gunshot injury to the eye and wearing of protective goggles in industries. In Nigeria, a lot of factory workers just work with their eyes exposed. They don't wear any protective goggles and we get a lot of eye injuries from industries and factories. So the next study I carried out was on consequences of traditional eye medications as seen in UBTH Benicity. This paper reported a six months prospective study of the consequences of using traditional eye medications. During this period, 30 patients out of 1,739 eye patients presented with ocular complications arising from the use of traditional eye medicines. This is a very common problem and quite serious. Of these, two of the patients had, um, had to have evisceration, removal of their eyeballs. Those who use traditional eye medicine had evisceration. Their eyeballs were removed. An artificial eye was fitted at the end of six weeks. And five of these patients who used traditional eye medications became bilaterally blind. They were blind in both eyes. Herbal extracts were the most commonly used traditional eye medicines, Osaho 1995. Traditional eye medicine use is very common during epidemics of acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. That is popularly known as Apollo, where a simple, self-limiting, Viral infection is converted to a blinding problem due to corneal perforation, panoptamitis, and name it. Inappropriate use of drugs, both orthodox and traditional eye medicines, which include cow's urine, patient's own urine, sugar solution, pepper, herbal extracts, and breast milk. Use of these various um, traditional medicine is very common during epidemics of Apollo. Um, there's a little story. One of the patients who used his own urine, he, he didn't know he had uh, gonorrhea. 
and, the, and both eyes became infected with the gonococcal organism and one of the eyes had to be removed because of very bad panoptomitis. We were able to salvage the other eye and he was left with very minimal vision in the other eye. But he lost the entire eyeball to panoptomitis as a result of use of his own urine because he was advised to use it. The next paper is on prevalence and causes of blindness in Otiboka, now Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital, Irua Edo State. In this study, the overall prevalence of blindness was 5%. And the leading causes of, of binocular blindness were cataracts, open angle glaucoma, and aphakia. We recommended that appropriate interventions needed to be involved to stem the trend of high prevalence of avoidable blindness. And we also talked about ocular trauma. Prevention of ocular trauma as eye injury was also emphasized as an essential factor in the reduction of blindness in children. Health education and bringing ophthalmological care to the doorsteps of the rural dwellers was also emphasized. This study was by Daudu Osaho and Emifuni in 2004. In another study on patients infected with HIV as seen in UBTH, we found that herpes zoster of Tamikus, a one-sided facial rash, and conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma were the commonest diseases encountered. Um, it was also uh, advocated that when you find patients presenting with one-sided facial rash and sudden onset bilateral blindness, you must clean such patients for HIV. This study was by Osahon and Ununu, 2007. The next um, paper is on severe measles and childhood blindness at the close of the 20th century. In this case report, a one-year-old baby became blind in both eyes from a severe attack of measles. It shouldn't be. Measles should not lead to blindness at this um, day and in, during this day and age. This underscores the decline in our healthcare delivery system as this tragedy occurred 40 years after the commencement of the expanded program of immunization. This study was by Osaho and Ibadin, 1999. Perforating eye injuries in children in Bini City, Nigeria. Eye injury is a very common cause of blindness in one eye in children. Please parents, note this. It's a very common cause of blindness in one eye in children, eye injury. The injuries are commonly sustained at home, or in the farm, or at school. We recommended adequate monitoring of children by their parents, guardians, and teachers. This study was by Otoyevi and Osahon, 2003. Motorcycle-related ocular injuries in Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital, Irua Edo State. The predominant age group in this study was 21 to 30 years age group, and those mostly affected were students, very young adults. The eyelids, the conjunctiva and cornea, were the most common eye structures. We recommended that the use of protective helmets be enforced and alternative job opportunities provided for this use. Study by Enoch, Dawodu, and Osahon, 2008. The next study is, was on ocular disorders amongst welders in a local government area of a dose state. Prevalence of ocular disorders in this study was high, 42.4%. And the common ocular disorders were pinguacuno, conjunctivitis, pterygium, corneal opacity. We also recommended that welders should be educated on the need for regular use of pro adequate protective eye devices to prevent work-related ocular problems as identified by the study. Okay, Osaho and Okmama, 2012. The next study was on ocular mobilities in targeted high-risk urban populations in Edo uh, states. 89% of the study population were over 40 years of age, as increasing age is a risk factor for ocular mobility and blindness. In the study, nine persons were blind and cataract was a major cause of blindness. We found a high distribution of ocular mobilities responsible for avoidable blindness in this high-risk urban population. 
study was by Momo Ukmoma and Osaho et al. 2014. Now we come to service to humanity. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, in keeping with the universe motto, which is knowledge for service, I believe I have a responsibility to apply the abundant knowledge and skills which I have acquired in this great university in meeting the high health needs of the populace. Consequently, apart from my primary assignment as Uniben UBTH, which includes site preservation and restoration, I have gone the extra mile to take eye care to the doorsteps of the rural populace, the understand in our society. As acting head of department between 1996 and 2000, I led my team of eye care professionals to several outreaches. We screened and carried out several free cataract surgeries in a health center in Ore the local government area of Edo State, in Igwaba Zua Health Center, and also in Igwene Dion Teaching Hospital, Kada. We recorded very good visual outcome. These are photographs we took during free cataract surgery program. These are some of the beneficiaries of free cataract surgery. Very happy beneficiaries. And that's my humble self, performing free cataract surgery. The World Glaucoma Week. Due to the magnitude of avoidable blindness from glaucoma globally, the WHO set aside one week in March every year to celebrate World Glaucoma Week. The aim is to increase awareness about glaucoma, especially among family members of glaucoma patients, because glaucoma runs in families. In the last two years, the theme has been beat invisible glaucoma, because glaucoma is a silent thief of sight. Last year, in conjunction with the Edo State Chapter of Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria, we led our team of eye care professionals on a walk for sight from the Bini Golf Course to Ring Road. These are some of the photographs we took during the World Glaucoma Week. And that's my humble self giving a health talk on glaucoma. <laughs> Collaboration with NGOs for free cataract operations. The first NGOs are my foundation. About one decade ago, we initiated collaboration with AME Foundation. It's an NGO, and this was with the permission of the then Chief Medical Director, Professor E. Okwere. He was very magnanimous. He allowed us to collaborate with this NGO, and this continued for several years. The aim was to ensure that cataract surgeries in the hospital were done at a highly subsidized rate. Hundreds of patients benefited from this initiative and cataract surgery output increased dramatically during this period. Other NGOs that have collaborated with us include the Good Luck Jonathan Free Cataract Surgery Program, the Ojuki of Baseki Foundation Free Cataract Surgery Program, the Phoenix Anira Free Cataract Surgery Program. I think some of these um, members of the foundation, they are present here. If you are here, please, can you stand up for recognition? The Felix Anira, the Oyuki Obaseki Foundation Free Cataract Surgery Program. Any of them here, please? Yes, that's uh, a member of the Oyuki Obaseki Foundation. I would like at this junction to acknowledge, uh, to acknowledge and appreciate these NGOs for being partners in progress in the prevention of blindness from cataracts. Thank you very much, and may God bless you almighty in Jesus' name. Amen. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I would like to go on to the other acknowledgements. Um, this aspect of the inaugural lecture is the most difficult aspect because it's not going to be possible to mention all the names. So I would like to crave your indulgence to request that you refer to the book because all the acknowledgements are listed in the book. We give glory and thanks to the Almighty God who has made today possible. I also want to thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor, 
and members of your management team for creating the enabling environment for us to perform our duties. My special thanks go to Professor Oji Oshodi, immediate past vice chancellor, during whose tenure my promotion to professor was announced. This elevated me to the position of the first female professor of ophthalmology in this great university. I wish to especially thank the chief medical director of UBTH, Professor Emma Ibadin, for his support for our department, especially since my tenure as HOD. He provided huge funds for expansion of our department. He purchased state-of-the-art equipment, including an optical coherence tomography machine. This is a very sensitive equipment for early diagnosis of glaucoma. At this juncture, I would like to invite members of the audience and the general public to visit our department to have this OCT done. It's a very good machine for early diagnosis of glaucoma. And the invitation goes more to family members of glaucoma patients because we know glaucoma is hereditary and it runs in families. If you don't already have glaucoma, just come visit us. We screen you and you do an OCT and it will tell us whether you have any glaucoma or not. It's a very expensive equipment. We just acquired this about three months ago. He has assisted in manpower development and he has created the enabling environment for us to perform our duties. Thank you very much, my CMD. I also thank and appreciate the former CMDs of UBTH, Professor A.O. Obasoha and Professor E.E. E. Okperi for their roles in the growth and development of our department. I wish to acknowledge my late father, Mr. S.I. Ibuagoen, an educationist for excellence and the famous author of the Ebedo series. He insisted on sound education for all his children without discrimination against the females, as was the common practice then, when the place of the girl child was in the kitchen, and more recently also the other room. My father used to wake us up in the early hours of the morning between 5 and 6 a.m. with a cup of water in his left hand and um, hitting us gently with his right hand to wake up, wash your faces and start to study while quoting the Shakespearean words and I quote, the heights great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flights but they, while their companions slept, were turning upwards in the night, end of quote. I also want to acknowledge and appreciate my stepmother, she's here in the audience, Mrs. Joy Eguavoy, for being there for me throughout my childhood. As I lost my mom at the age of 18 months. I was just 18 months when I lost my mom. My presentation goes to the following. My primary and secondary school teachers and my university lecturers in the medical school. I salute you all for your toothache. I wish to acknowledge my teacher, mentor, and father in the profession, Emeritus Professor J.O. Ayari, the doyen of ophthalmology. I want, to, I want to appreciate you especially, sir, for your encouragement and tutelage throughout my residency training program, and even post-residency, you taught me how to write scientific papers. Thank you very much, sir. The provost of the College of Medical Sciences, Bishop Professor Via Iyawe, he was my classmate in the medical school. Uh, I appreciate you for your love and support and for always being there for my family. My dean, Professor Moses Momo, God bless you for your support. <laughs> my special thanks also go to Professor Gia Akenswa, the Enoki of Ewoba Lusa, and former DVC at me, Uniben, a consultant pediatric oncologist who encouraged me to write my third published paper on the causes of enucleation of the eye in UBTH. I must not forget Emeritus Professor Aro Ufwe. Thank you very much, sir. And Professor Ella Ojewu for their love and support throughout my academic pursuits. Special thanks go to my teachers in the United Kingdom, 
Thank you all for the knowledge imparted on me. I wish to acknowledge my sweetheart, my heart drop, Dr. Ruben Osaume Osama. He's the apple of my eyes and the sugar of my tea. He encouraged me to specialize in this great specialty. And he supported me all through the period of examination preparation when, I had, when he had to take care of the children, when I was away for update courses and workshops. My sweetheart, I must use this opportunity to thank you specially for giving me the freedom and the enabling environment to pursue my career as an academic. God bless you, my city. To our children, Dr. Ebu Wairebo, Dr. Sikel Senzwa, and their wonderful husbands, our son-in-laws, our sons-in-law, Dr. Osamu Erebo and Mr. Kenneth Osezwa, I thank all of you specially for your immense support and prayers all along and during the preparation for this lecture. To our grandchildren, Osasoki, Ebo Setani, Osawese, Osazeme, and Omoefe, I thank you all for being our greatest source of joy. I love and cherish all of you. Unfortunately, you are not able to be here because of your tight schedule in the United States. This is my family, the children and grandchildren. I wish to acknowledge my siblings, starting from the eldest, who is now the mistress of our family, a retired principal, Mrs. Divi Obeide, for her love and support for my childhood to date. Thank you for being there for me, and indeed for all of us. I wish to especially thank my elder brother, Professor Osayamo Egwavoen a colleague in academia who kindled my interest in the basic sciences at the secondary school level. That's my elder brother. He also painstakingly provided lecturer assistance for this lecture. My other seven siblings were 10 in number. I thank you all for your love and support. My thanks also go to their spouses. Uh, the eldest of them, Dr. Daniel Ubeide. Thank you, sir, for your wise counsel. God bless you, sir. At this juncture, I would like to thank my in-laws, the Osaho family of Ekia Dolo, for your love and support, for providing the enabling environment for me to realize my goals and aspirations while married to my husband, your brother. You have all been very supportive and caring, and the family has been very closely knit and indeed. I wish to acknowledge my senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Chika Osai Oba, whose daily prayers and sermons have availed much for my spiritual growth. I salute you, sir, for always being there for me and my family. I want to thank the other pastors in my church, and in fact, all members of my church here present. Thank you all for finding time to grace this occasion. My prayer partner, friend and confidant, Mrs. Amber Otikio Divi. Thank you so much for all the prayers and for always being there for me. She's in the audience. Thank you very much, ma'am. My special thanks also go to the women group and the entire members of the church, my fellow deacons and deaconesses. I appreciate all of you for your unflinching support and prayer. I wish to thank the members of the Bini Unity League, of which my husband is the current president, as well as Edo College Old Boys Association, ECOBA, of which my husband is also the current national president for finding time to grace this occasion. My fellow golfers of the Bini Golf, of the Bini Club Golf Section, I thank you all for your support. Let's keep swinging to remain young and fit. I want to especially appreciate my colleagues in the department. I couldn't have gotten this far without you. All the professors, I appreciate all of you. My younger consultant colleagues, Resident doctors, past and present, too numerous to mention. I appreciate all of you and I thank you all for your support, especially since my tenure as head of the department. I wish to thank the other staff of the department for their love and support, the optometrists, the nurses, the pharmacists, all of them. I salute you all. My secretary, Mrs. O'Hare, I appreciate you for your um, diligence and hard work. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. I would now like to proceed to make my recommendations. The recommendations. The postgraduate medical colleges should intensify efforts in the training of ophthalmic specialists in Nigeria. 
The current ratio of three ophthalmologists to one million population is grossly inadequate. This cannot meet the eye health needs of the populace. Similarly, the training of other members of the eye care team should be accelerated. Efforts should be made to deploy eye medical doctors, ophthalmic nurses, optometrists to work in the rural areas where we have the highest prevalence of needless blindness. They need to be encouraged to do so by granting them suitable incentives as part of their conditions of service. This will address the maldistribution of personnel. Aging was emphasized as a risk factor for blindness. Therefore, all adults 40 years and above should have comprehensive eye check at least once in two years so that potentially blinding eye disorders can be picked up and treatment instituted. Most government hospitals, as well as approved private facilities with qualified ophthalmologists are capable of providing this service. The Center for Disease Control in UBTH is one of such centers. Since inception, we have screened 5,000 persons in the CDC UBTH. And we have picked up many glaucoma suspects and glaucoma patients. So please avail yourself of the opportunity of being screened at the CDC in UBTH so that potentially blinding eye diseases can be picked up and treated. Public-private partnership should be encouraged as government alone cannot provide all the needed equipment for optimal eye care. Universal eye health care, affordable, accessible, and available eye health care for all should be practiced by all stakeholders rendering eye care services. Ministries of Health should establish primary eye care units in all the primary health care centers in Nigeria. This will help reduce the practice of using disruptive traditional eye medications and patronage of quacks. Quality education, illiteracy was emphasized as a risk factor for blindness. Quality education, economic empowerment, and poverty alleviation will no doubt also help in curbing the menace of needless blindness. Antenatal care for all pregnant women so that potentially blinding problems can be detected and treated early enough. Public enlightenment should be intensified in the mass media in the form of jingles, preferably in the local languages as well as speaking English. More cultural surgery outreaches to rural areas should be organized in order to reduce the national cataract backlog as well as tackle the problem of couching. Partnership with NGOs in this regard will be helpful as they are key partners in progress in the prevention of cataract blindness. Finally, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, mandatory eye tests should be incorporated into the process leading up to the issuance of a driving license as obtained in developed countries, US, UK, a, 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 a very comprehensive eye test is carried out before you are issued a driver's license. This is due to the, this is to reduce the contribution of visual impairment to road traffic accidents. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, in conclusion, in the last one hour or so, I have informed this distinguished audience about the various causes of avoidable blindness and efforts that have been made over the years to fight this scourge. I have also highlighted my humble contribution in various areas. My sincere prayer is that we shall all indeed live to actually see our children's children in our old age and not become needlessly blind. God bless ophthalmology practice in Nigeria. God bless our great universe. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you all for listening and God bless you all.
please another round of applause for uh, As we take our seats, when I invite the immediate family of the inaugural lecturer to please come forward as the vice chancellor that is the inaugural lecturer.
we want to recognize the presence of the CEO, Nigeria Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, Professor Mrs. L. Salami. We recognize the presence of Professor E. U. Emovo. We want to welcome you and recognize you, sir. We recognize the presence of former CMD UPTH, Professor Obasan. We want to also recognize the presence of Bishop Dr. Edi Omoyi Okundaye. We recognize the presence of Mr. and Princess Mrs. Ikwinoba. We want to welcome you and thank you for coming. We recognize the presence of all chiefs here present. We recognize the Baptist family seated. Wherever you are, please put your hands together for yourself. <laughs> Members of the Osao and the Guaguan families will recognize you. The former President NMA, Dr. Enapulele, we also want to welcome and recognize your presence. Honestly, the list before me is longer than the inaugural lecture itself. If I don't mention your name, please just understand that the inaugural lecturer appreciates your presence. You are visiting the University of Benin. The University of Benin recognizes you. We welcome you and we pray that God will bless you continuously. Past CMD ISTH, Dr. S. O. Daudu, we recognize you and welcome you. Immediately after now, we will, all guests are expected to be at the banquet hall for a wonderful reception put together by the inaugural lecturer. For our students, we want to appeal to you that your refreshment may not hold today. <laughs> Except you go for glaucoma test. <laughs> so you can see the venue. So we appeal that immediately after the closing formalities, students you wait behind will tell you where your reception venue will be. May we please rise.
the Vice Chancellor will lead the procession out of the auditorium.